Welcome to VCEC. Good morning. We have a new camera today. Can you see the new camera? It's over by the clock. So if you're sat in this zone, you may or may not be seen. Well, we can see you at the back of your head. Anyway, but we are going to um, invite the team to come on up to lead us in a time of awesome song. We're doing songsters. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> songsters, come on up. Who, who's leading us in the time of songster? Anyone? Are you? Yeah. Is it you? Who's this? What's your name? <laughs> My name's Sam. Hi, What's Sam. Your name? I'm, I'm Anzi. Anyway, come and lead us in a time of song. Why don't we all come closer to, to, the, to the team and we're going to sing some lovely songster songs. Are we ready? Yeah. Hey, good morning, church family. Um, if you're able to, why don't you stand with me? And we're just going to do um, a fun little song to song to uh, get started. So if you're able to, why don't, we, uh, why don't you stand with me? And um, yeah, we're going to start. So for this song, I need all of your help. So uh, do we all have hands? Yeah. Can you show me your hands? Wave them about. So we're going to have to clap, but to the beat. So Shara, can you give us a beat? And then we'll uh, clap to it, yeah? Okay, you ready? And if you know the song, the lyrics are on the screen, so... team for leading us in our lovely songsters. You may all be seated. Good morning. We are on a high speed morning service. It's all good and fun. Glad to have you guys join us. Last week, uh, we normally do birthdays on the first Sunday of the month, but we knew all the kids love celebrating their birthday. So anyone in the birthday in the month of March, who has a birthday in the month of March? Raise your hand. Oh, we got one. Come on up. We have something for you. If you've got a birthday in the month of March, it might, is it just Ashlyn? Ashlyn's, oh, look at these beautiful magnets, coasters, magnets. Oh, look at these magnets that you can put onto things like your credit cards. No, just kidding. Don't do that. Anyways, it's chip and pin now. The magnetic strip won't be destroyed. Okay, come on. Hi. 
唔怕唔怕。Hello， no， oh, just one。Oh, happy birthday! Do you want to take one too, Ashlyn? Happy birthday! Any other March birthdays? March birthdays. Well, I know it's early in the month, early in the year, so there's less birthdays. But I'm sure by July, September, October, when those warm months start rolling around, they'll have more birthdays. So, okay, with that, happy birthday! Shall we sing happy birthday, anyways? Yes, let's sing that. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to March! Any more March people? Happy birthday to you! Yay! Exciting times. Um, <laughs> we are uh, supposed to have a storyteller right now. Um, but our storyteller is not here, so that only puts a small damper on our time scale. Um, but that's okay. Uh, I guess. Um, what are we going to do now, Ben? Ah, Steve is going to come and save the day. Storyteller Steve is going to come and save the day. Come on up here. So I'm just checking my text to see what the story was for this week. Oh wait, our storyteller's here. If our storyteller comes up here right now. Otherwise, I'll have to freestyle it. I'll do the beatboxing. So I'll just kill time over here for a minute. Um, it's okay. Have you got the book? Oh, it's not. Okay. All right. I'll hand over. Morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late. I like to keep you all on your toes. So before I get into the story, I just wanted to ask you a question. Can you guys think of something that is your favorite thing? Not raindrops on <laughs> roses, but can you think of something that is really important to you, something that was one of your favorite things? Steve? My books. Your books, okay. Do you guys want to see something that's one of my favorite things? Yeah, I'll show you, hang on. Okay, so this, this, <laughs> I know, it's one of my favorite things. So this was from my hen party. So a hen party is when um, you have a party before you get married, or the, or, the, or the women have one, or the men have one. Um, and we went pottery painting for mine, and all the women that went, and all like my family and my good friends, they all put their fingerprint on, and then they became little chicks. And then it's really fun, because if you pour tea out of it, it looks like the, the hen's being sick. But it's really fun. It's one of my favorite things. So it's fun. Okay, so let's go on to the story from the Bible today. So the story is the rich young ruler. Right, so he saw Jesus and he was like, hey, Jesus, good teacher. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? See, classic Jesus answering a question with a question. Jesus says, no one is good, only God. Only God is good. And then he says, well, you follow my commandments, right? You, you know my commandments. Do not steal, do not murder, do not tell, tell lies, honor your father and mother. And the rich young ruler's like, I've done all those things since I was a boy. So he's like feeling really smug. But then Jesus says one more thing. You need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you have treasures in heaven and you can come follow me. And the rich young ruler was really sad because he was really wealthy. He had lots of money. And then Jesus said, it's, it's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. It's as hard as a camel, big camel, going through the eye of a needle. So it's very hard. And so we see from this story that the rich young ruler's favorite things was money because he was really sad to sell all his things. Because if, 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 if that wasn't important to him, he'd be happy, wouldn't he? But he was sad. So you could tell that money and things were probably his favorite things. So he probably put God and then money and things. So for us, it could be our toys. It could be you know, our money. It could be what people think of us. We could put all those things above God. But God is saying we need to put him first. God should be our favorite thing. 
that our most important thing that we put in front of everything else. So that's it. That's our story for today. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy, for the lovely story telling. Okay, so we're going to dismiss the kids off to Explorer classes. So if you are a grand explorer, you are now downstairs, but the little explorers will be upstairs. And then so if you, if you go <laughs> orange shirt, and then you've got, oh, hang on. <laughs> which age is which age? If your kids are in Little Explorers, they follow the red shirts and they're going upstairs. Okay, so that's ages, preschool and reception. If your years one, two, and three, you're going to follow the green shirts there, and that's junior explorers. And if you are years four, five, six, you're going up, you're going to the middle classroom in the orange shirts, and they're just signing them in right there. If you're here for the first time, scan the QR code. That definitely helps us. Or you can scan the QR code on the way in. That lets us know if your kids have any allergies or things like that. We can't wait till we can start actually giving them food. All right, back over to Aunt Sonia now. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to come back to a time of worship, and we're just going to sing one worship song before we get into the service, well, the sermon. Worship? Yeah. Okay. Right. Are we ready? Shall we all stand and just prepare our hearts ready for worship, and then... We'll hit the lights as well. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, we're just going to come to a time of worship, so why don't you just make yourselves comfortable, and we're just going to sing a couple songs. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy sun comes up the sun comes up it's a new day dawn it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes. We bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, we worship His holy. Oh. 
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise This next song we're going to sing is Living Hope, and I don't know if uh, this is the first time you'll sing it or the 1,000th, 1000th, but um, yeah, it's uh, such a great song of uh, declaration to um, who God is and um, just His promises to us, and I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news this week or um, if you've, even in your personal life, have, um, you know, challenges or struggles. I know I have. Um, but one thing we can be sure of and one thing we can look to is, is God's hope for us um, and his promises to us. Um, he's hoped, um, yeah, the hope he gives us is um, a hope of salvation, um, that he has defeated um, sin and death, that he already has the victory. Um, there's this amazing verse in Hebrews 10 which says, let us hold to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Isn't that such an, an amazing verse that God is faithful to us? Um, that he will never let us down. Um, so yeah, as we sing this song, um, let's just hold on to um, the hope that God gives us, um, the truth that God has defeated um, death, that he has conquered all. Um, and even as wars rage on, um, he has already won the war. Um, that even though um, there are challenges and things in our life that um, distract us, um, God is always with us um, and that is his promise. Um, so as we sing, let's just not sing with just our mouths. Um, let's really sing with our hearts and let's declare these words to God because um, that's a God who we believe in because um, we are children of the Most High God and um, that he's promised us an eternity of, um, yeah, with him, um, that there will be no more tears, no more pain, uh, but we get to share in an eternity with him uh, where we are co-heirs with the kingdom, um, with um, the king and his kingdom. So let's come to a time of worship. And let's, shall we sing together? How great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written oh jesus christ my living hope. who could imagine so great a man could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Oh, the cross, the cross is spoken. I am forgiven. 
the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the Father God, we praise you uh, today. Uh, Father God, we thank you that um, you are the one who broke our chains. We are continuing on with our Lent series. Uh, I don't know if you've been following, but there are definitely books at the front table, or you can scan the QR code and you can follow along. We're on week three, and we'll be having a reading in a moment just after these announcements. So that's very exciting, and I hope God has been speaking to you all. There's also this science and faith um, call, as, as uh, Ben called it, call outreach. He just called it Cool Outreach because it's great for you to invite your friends, um, especially colleagues or people. And there's all these different uh, workshops um, that you can attend. We do have to pay a little fee, but um, this is worth going to. Um, these are the save the dates. We need to sort out registration. We need to, yeah, we need, they need to sort out registration, not us. Um, but then, um, yeah, so it's quite exciting because these are big, big names. Um, so it's very, very exciting. Um, mental health science, climate change, all these big topics, which is very, very good and exciting to get involved in and attend and invite your friends to. Okay. Um, and this is uh, next on an announcement. The, uh, basically, we're going to gather um, loads of volunteers in this hall. Uh, if you want to be involved in helping this charity called GAIN, uh, it's Global, global, I forget, I forget, global Aid 
something nah, network. <laughs> international? I think it's international. Um, so they're, they're, they're connected to Agape, the charity, a Christian charity. And it's, it's to help with the relief fund. And um, yeah, so we're going to be collecting and helping them pack in this church hall on Thursday evening. So if you want to get involved in that, just scan that QR code because we are looking for more hands to um, help with the packing and loading boxes into their trucks and things. Um, we are also asking for people to help donate essential hygiene packs. Uh, these are the list of things that they are asking for as well. Um, so, I mean, if you want more information, come and speak to myself. But um, this is a quite a, an extensive list. But these are the things that um, the people that are refugees from Ukraine, are, uh, you know, they need. These are the b basic bare necessities. And so, um, yeah, hopefully we can all contribute with that. Um, we're still collecting until Thursday. Um, next up, we've got baptisms coming up, and that will be on the 3rd of April in a few weeks' time. But registration deadline is today. And this is what's coming up. Baptism service is, uh, yeah, in April. But um, these are the topics that we will be going through soon. And now we're going to come to a time of offering. So today's offering is a bit special because we've got, um, we've got... Uh, two, two different colored bags. Um, there's going to be four volunteers, two holding red bags, which is going to be the normal offering for our normal tithing purposes. And the two blue bags are going to be for the Ukraine collection. Okay, so we're going to be uh, sending this money to a charity, again, uh, Agape again. And so uh, please note which bag that you put it in. So um, if you uh, want to transfer, by online giving, you can scan that QR code as well for those at home that want to give. Uh, make sure you put a reference aid, A-I-D, um, as, as, so that we know, the treasury team can know where that fund is going to um, yeah, Ukraine. And right now we're just going to invite um, our two readers to come on up and read our lovely psalm, uh, Sila reading for today. So this week's um, reading is from Psalm 46. Blessed is the one whose transgressions is forgiven. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the air gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habit habitation of the Most High. God is the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The God of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Thank you for reading God's word this morning, uh, Holly and Victor. And now um, we're just going to invite Pastor Bert to come on up and lead us in our sermon. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, super glad to have you guys here. If you guys know us, today we have a very interesting, interesting kind of passage that we're looking at. Uh, Jesus, disciples, and the Samaritans. Um, our three, our five services are trying to get a little bit more connection across all five services, uh, which means we get to preach similar messages in the English as we do in the Cantonese. Uh, but of course, uh, with a little bit of different time, you can add a little bit more different elements to it. Um, but we're looking at this passage today also in Luke chapter 9. So last week, Ben talked about Luke chapter 9, about being the greatest. And it was really good. He gave us a lot of context about it. This week's passage is a really strange one. I was saying I'd never heard a sermon on it. Uh, I'd never had to preach a sermon on it because I pick which passages I want to read, and this seems like a really weird one to pick. Um, but uh, as we were thinking about, I, I, this passage is, is so relevant to kind of what's happening now, uh, but also kind of the things that we see in this world. Um, so let me read this passage out, Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. 
When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. This passage is, is, is bizarre, right? It's really strange because it's the disciples. They go to, they try to go to, they're trying to go to Jerusalem, right? Jesus like, let's go to Jerusalem. They want to cut through Samaria. They go to Samaria. The Samaritans are like, sorry, we don't want you passing through our village or like our whole area because uh, you're going to Jerusalem. They kick him out. And then the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven to destroy the village? Like, should we kill everyone in this village? Like, it seems very extreme kind of response to, like, hey, we don't want you in this area, right? And so I want to kind of explore, like, what is, the, what is the deal with that? What is that whole issue? And there is this whole issue between Jews and Samaritans, and it's important for us to be kind of understand this kind of context. Now, as I tell you about this, you will naturally start drawing comparisons to the way this world is mapped out, the way people's relationships are. And it's really fascinating because when you read the Bible, you have to understand um, like the view of the Old Testament, this is like, like thousands of years of history, right? So the historical issues that people have, the boundary lines that are drawn, the people groups that are raised up here, these tensions that exist are the kind of tensions that we see in modern society today, right? And we can talk about uh, even the war that's happening right now in, in between Ukraine and, and Russia and this sense of fire from heaven being dropped down but done by mankind's hands. So we want to look at this, and to kind of understand this, it's important to understand what the beef between the Jews and Samaritans kind of is. Um, so here's a little map. Uh, this is from the ESV uh, Study Bible. Uh, if you, if you, by the way, if you have one, that's a great study Bible to have. Um, and this kind of maps out uh, Israel and Judah. So now this is 720 BC. So this is a long time ago, and this is when uh, Israel had been divided to a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom called Judah. The southern kingdom. Uh, the northern kingdom called Israel. The southern kingdom called Judah. And Jerusalem, if you might see, is in Judah, and Israel is where Samaria is. Now, what happened was the Assyrians came uh, and conquered the northern kingdom. And uh, if you've never uh, been part of an empire before, there's a couple ways to do empire building, okay? Uh, this is like civilization, if you're curious. If you're an empire, you can move in, you conquer the land, then you take the inhabitants of that land and you disperse them amongst your own kingdom, like as prisoners, or you relocate them, and you move your own people in. The reason you do that is so that your own people take over the land, build loyalty there, and the normal people can't combine together to, to form revolutions against your new empire. So that's what the Assyrians did uh, just before uh, they got taken over by the Babylonians and, uh, and then got taken over by the Persians. Uh, so they did that. Now, what happened was some uh, Israelites were still living in Israel, even though it was conquered uh, by the Assyrians. And those people, they started to marry uh, the foreign invaders. And by marrying the foreign invaders, their kids were then mixed. Uh, they were mixed between Assyrians and uh, Jewish people. And this new group of people eventually became Sumerians, Samarit and what we know later as Samaritans. So it's kind of like you marrying an enemy, a sworn enemy of yours, and like their kids then being in that population, and a lot of other people don't like the idea. So that's what ends up happening. So this is the idea of, right, uh, so Assyria comes in, conquers, and, and does all this stuff. Now, we know later, then when the Persians take over, uh, the Persians have a different kind of methodology. They're like, oh, we want you to be loyal to us. So you guys can go back to your homelands and stuff like that. And one of the guys, Nehemiah, was like, oh, can I go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? So in the book of Nehemiah, uh, he goes back, and as they're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, they face opposition, and they face opposition from Samaritans. So people of Samaria who are ex-Jewish, ex-part of like their historical past, are putting up opposition towards them rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So you can start seeing there is a lot of, there's a lot of tension, and this is like hundreds of years of tension. It's like people and their countries no longer liking another country because of what happened historically in the past. I, can, I think we can look at British colonialism as, as something that might have done this to many countries around the world. Um, or we can look at certain other cases happening in the world today which have that same kind of tension. So even though there's some ethnic similarity, the historical grievances and this kind of new culture that arises from there creates such a huge tension. Um, we start realizing that here there's historical, cultural, racial, and religious 
conflict between people. And when we talk about religious, um, at this point, Samaritans and Jewish people, they believed in the same God. They believed in the same Messiah. But Samaritans felt like it's not going to happen in Jerusalem. And where the Jews were, it's all about Jerusalem. But the Samaritans, it's like, you know, it's being Mount uh, Gaizan here in Samaria. And so they had this different perspective on where the Messiah would go or where the Messiah would reign and what that would look like. And that religious tension meant that, man, the Jews and the Samaritans had this long-standing enmity, this real anger towards each other. Historical, cultural, racial, and religious. And I think if we think about those things today, that's quite often the things that we have towards hate towards people, don't we? Like, I mean, as much as I, you probably don't want me to hear you say it, but Chinese people are pretty racist. Like, it's not, like, it's not very good. Like, we have cultural biases. We have historical biases. I, and Chinese people are interested because we can be racist towards other Chinese people, depending on where they're from. Like, it's, it's that bad. Is it still considered racism? I don't know. And it's, like, so complicated. But it's those same kind of tensions. We have hate that comes historically, culturally, religiously. And it's those things that, these kind of barriers that we see what's happening here with the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, okay, I don't want to talk about Chinese people. I don't want to talk about politics in the world because that's yeah, a hot topic. Um, but I want to talk about and try to understand what's happening in this passage. Like, the disciples' response seems a little bit intense, right? Like, so like, oh, they're like, oh, we don't want to go, we don't want you in this village. Take the long way around, go all the way around Samaria. Like, Okay, cool, I would get it, like, yeah, fine, all right, fine. I get it. you'll like us. But the disciples' response is like, Jesus, shall we destroy the village using the fire and brimstone that we see in one kings? And when they tell Jesus, it's like, they're assuming Jesus is going to be like, yeah, good idea, bro. Because, I mean, you don't make a suggestion to Jesus unless you think he's going to say yes, right? So they're like convinced, yeah, this is an awesome idea. Let's kill them all, which is horrible, like, how did they get to the point where they start thinking, like, like this is a good idea? Jesus is going to be like, yeah, disciples? Oh, I'm really proud of you, James and John, sons of thunder. Woo! Um, so let's rewind. To understand where this is coming from, we have to rewind. And in chapter 9, at the very beginning of chapter 9, this is what happens. Jesus calls the 12 together, and he gives them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases, and then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. This is verse 1 and 2. And then they do that. And in verse 6, it says, And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. These disciples, these are ordinary people, right? These are fishermen. They're like common people. These are the people who flunked out of, uh, like, religious school, and they had to take other jobs. But here they are now. Jesus has given them power. And it's the same power that Jesus has. Jesus has been going around doing these same things. And now the disciples are going out to these different villages, and they're healing and they're casting out demons. And everyone's probably looking at these guys like, whoa, you guys are like Jesus people. Like, they're like influencers. They suddenly, like, have fans, right? People are liking what they're doing. It's amazing. I can now do this as a symbol of like. That's really weird. Um, this idea of they suddenly have this fame, but they also have this power. And it's starting to make them be more proud about who they are. And we see this because as we look through the rest of chapter 9, they keep saying things to Jesus about how they're special and they should send other people away, right? Like, what happens in the feeding of the 5,000? Feeding of the 5,000, they get there, everyone starts getting hungry, and what do the disciples say? Send them away so that we can eat, right? Make them go away, these commoners. You know, like, we have no more energy to heal them or teach them. Send them away, because we want to eat, right? The disciples are, are really getting to this point where they're like, we're here, and everyone else is beneath us. And what does Jesus say to them, right? Jesus' response is, no, you feed them. So Jesus is trying to get them to look differently, like look outward, see that they're supposed to be blessing, and see that they're supposed to be encouraging, bringing life and bringing blessing to people around. But the disciples keep thinking, like, no, we're here, and these people are like, there are, like, followers. They're, like, subservient to us. We're better than them. So they're, like, send them away. And Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. Later on, it goes in uh, verse 4 and 9. They see another guy driving out demons. And the disciples come to Jesus, and they're, like, so annoyed. Like, oh, 
who does this guy think he is? He's not even a true disciple like we are. And then Matt John's like, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. You know, like, he's not one of us. And Jesus' response is, hey, if he's doing this in my name, it doesn't matter. Like, this is still a good thing. You can imagine the disciples are like, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? You know, we're like the OG crew, and these other people, like, they don't fit in with us. It's this pride, it's this arrogance that's really showing up in their life, and it creeps in really quickly. We can all have this kind of pride and arrogance in our life that, that makes us look down on other people, that makes us think we're, we're better than them. And it's really subtle. Like, I don't think none of all of us plan out being like, oh, yeah, I really think I'm better than them. But the way you judge them, the way you start acting around them, the way you look at them starts to shift. It's this whole sense of this idea that we're better or we're smarter or we're wiser or we're greater or we have more experience or we've been through more things. We just know better. And it's true. You genuinely might know better. But when that pride and that arrogance takes over, you lose the ability to love, and you're more focused on trying to get them to listen. Now, this is my big fear, okay? So, you know, I've been pastoring for a long time uh, in this country. I, I'm American, but I'm, I've been working with the Chinese churches for so long. And I also know that there is a high possibility that after, like, 25, 30 years of experience, I'm going to become that guy who, like, when people are talking to me, I'm monologuing. I, can, I sound like a villain. I know I'm just going off, and I'm trying to tell them, <sighs> you know, I've been through all this. I understand. You just need to listen to me. If you do it my way, it'll be better. And I can tell. I slip into that. Like, and I know because I hang out with other pastors, and I can hear them slipping into that. And I'm like, do we all just want to hear our own voice to tell people what we know and expect them to follow? And it's hard because I can tell. I don't want to become that person. And yet there's this pride that's building up in me that, that almost doesn't give me that joy of remembering where it all came from. For the disciples, they forgot. These guys, like, are not high members standing aside. They didn't start out, like, knowing all this stuff. Jesus called them in. He brought them close to him. And it's his life that's going out from it. It's not my own greatness. It's not your own grace. It is the fact that we belong to Jesus that should compel us to love. Like, how can you be arrogant or proud when you realize, oh, I'm standing next to Jesus, the almighty Savior of the world, who at the same time is so humble. Like, I want to be and strive towards this. For the church, we have the same problem. We have this idea that actually we're on the inside. We're the inside people. And all those people out there, they're the heathens. They're the enemy. Right? You get churches that really have that sense, like, this is the church, and those are the outsiders. Like, is that, is that what our church is like? And it's hard, because we are primarily ethnically Chinese. I'm like, it looks like a racist church. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, we're all, I mean, but the reason we gather together, of course, is because there's some commonality that we share, that we lose when we're in other places, because we know what it feels like to not be welcomed in those spaces. But as an English congregation in a Chinese-speaking church, we have to understand how precious it is for us to be this welcoming community, not because we're great, but because we know what it's like to be on the outside and how precious it is that Jesus calls us to be on the inside. At the end of the day, like, people, we're not that different. Yeah, maybe the things we like to eat are different. Maybe the things that we like to wear or the things that we look on our, our Internet pages are different. But at our heart, we all still want you know, love and joy and peace. We want fellowship. We want friendship. We want connection. We want understanding. And yet we lose sight of all that to think like, no, we're we, we're ourselves, or I'm just about myself. That you lose sight that there is great joy in actually being humble and learning and loving the people around us. Like Jesus kept saying to them, right, you feed them. You deny yourself, take up your cross. It's not against us. He's got this picture of actually bringing blessing and being blessing. Like, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Your life mission is to bring blessing to people outside and to be blessing to them. It's not about trying to get them to acknowledge you or to say that, oh, you're one of Jesus' followers. We know later Peter gets called out as one of Jesus' followers. He's like, no, 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 not me. 
Rather, we have to have this idea, God, everywhere we go, let us bring blessing, let us be blessing. And when you look through the book of Acts, that's what you see, right? The disciples change into these people who are just bringing blessing to the world around. The first question I have to ask you guys then, are you looking down on others? Do you look down on others? And, and it, it might come out of pride. It might come out of insecurity. It might come out of bad habits. But if you're looking down on others, that's going to cause a problem. So uh, when I was a young worship leader, uh, like Sam's age, um, I'd go to different worship events around our, in, in like Southern California. And uh, we'd go to another church, and we'd go there to worship. But while they're worshiping, all I'm doing is thinking to myself, oh, really, that chord progression? Hmm, interesting choice. Uh, or else as they're singing a song, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure about this song. I wonder. And, and as I'm sitting there, I'm not worshiping at all, right? I've, I've almost got my arms crossed. Like, well, I've got two years of experience of worshiping because I was like 16, right? Like, I'm awesome. And I'm judging all the worship that, that you, you're like, you, you completely forget that this is an expression of love towards God, not like some just sort of technical performance. I'm not watching a recital, right? This is not Lang Lang playing piano, right? We're, we're here to kind of appreciate how great our God is. And it took me a long time to get past that. Part of, yes, I want to learn, I want to grow, but actually the heart of this moment is to really be worshipful, to be humble, to be to worship in any circumstance. And it's such a, it's just a shift to switch from being judgmental to turning around just being gracious, to understand that, hey, we all had to learn someplace. Like, I didn't wake up one morning and I'm like, I'm awesome at the guitar. You will know if you've seen me try to play the Urhu. That's like, it's a horrible experience right now. But we're all learning. We all have a chance to learn and grow as believers. The cool thing about not being proud or arrogant is you understand that there's still more to learn from all the people around us and from the different things that we're going through. It becomes a sharing exchange as opposed to just a didactic one. Okay, so let's go on. Let's look at this a little bit more. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. At the end of the day, this idea of uh, calling fire down from heaven, so it shows up in 1 Kings, and it's uh, where Elijah like, calls down fire from heaven. It's a symbol of uh, judgment, of, of almost like destruction for sin. And the disciples, like, when they're suggesting this, it's not just about sin. It's about, like, we hate Samaritan people. Like, we don't believe Samaria is going to exist when Jesus becomes king anyways. So let's just get this party started now. Let's show them how we have the fire and the power and we'll destroy them. And this is hilarious because Jesus, at the start of this, it says, Jesus resolutely or set his eyes towards Jerusalem. Which means in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is like, the time is coming now where I'm going to give up my life as a sacrifice to save mankind's relationship with God. I'm going to suffer and die on the cross. And I resolutely set my face towards Jerusalem because I know I'm going to suffer and die. Like Jesus is like, I'm going to give my life up. Not just for my friends, but for my enemies. For all sinners. And the disciples, meanwhile, are like, we got the power. We're going to call down fire from heaven. We're going to reign like kings on this world, right? It's a completely mixed up point of view. And Jesus here is still, this whole time, he's trying to get them to see differently. But their pride and their arrogance, but also their racism and their intolerance is blinding them to the truth. The truth of the matter, most cultures are going to carry some sort of racial bias, some sort of personal perspective that we look at differently. And that's okay to have a racial bias, unless, of course, you're doing programming because you want to avoid having racial bias in your programming because otherwise you'll have a problem. But we will have tinted perspectives on how we see things. But the problem is when we become racist, when we look down on other cultures, look down on other people, where we think we're just superior to them. And it's a hard line between saying the Chinese food is the best to oh, those people are always like that. And yet, we know what it's like to have that feeling too, right? When someone says to us, you people, or the best is when someone starts a conversation with us, I don't want to sound racist. And it's like, please, 
whatever you're going to say next <laughs> is going to sound racist. But we all have had that experience, right? Where you have this, ex this sense of what it feels like to be judged based on your color, your circumstance. But it doesn't make us right for us to judge other people in the same way because of that circumstance. And yet we do. And it could be from what we've seen on TV. It could be what we read on the news. It could be how we were treated growing up. But it doesn't make it right. Like the most amazing thing about God's love is that he doesn't, he doesn't, he generally doesn't judge us based on our color or our background. His forgiveness and his love transcends all of that. And when we're welcomed into his community, that's that transforming power to say, you know, as Christians, we see differently. We can love differently. See, for the Jewish people, they're looking at Samaritans as a culture they despise. Like a people they hate, a belief against our, against theirs. I mean, we, we do the same thing, right? Uh, we're scared of Muslims because we're, you're, they're terrorists, you know? We pick people and friends based on color. We prefer some races over others, even though I have no idea why. It's not like any of these races are particularly wonderful. We pick governments over each other, and, and it's hard because we start adding politics, race, culture. And yes, there are bad people out there, and there are bad governments, and there are bad societies. But when our arrogance overtakes that, we lose sight of how great Jesus really is. Jesus has seen so many empires rise and fall. Any British Empire? Guilty. American Empire, pretty bad. Um, Roman Empire, I think they were up to a lot of no good too. In other words, when we ally ourselves with just the politics, we lose sight of Jesus. It doesn't mean that Jesus can't help us influence political situations. But when we hold on to that hate, it blinds us from the love that God might have. Once again, for, the, for uh, the disciples, they actually think this is what Jesus wants. They think the same feelings they hate towards this race, towards the Samaritans, that's what Jesus has too. That's why they suggest it, right? Because they're convinced Jesus is going to be like, do it, do it now. Like, I'm going to press the button. I'm going to launch all these, like, meteorites, you know, down onto this thing. I, don't, I know I should know how fire from heaven works. Um, but the key thing is here, they feel think this is what Jesus wants, but it's not actually what Jesus wants. We have that same problem, and you see it come up all the time in churches and society where people say, oh, no, I'm sure this is what Jesus wants, but does he really want that? If you don't know the heart of God, then you're going to be running on your own assumptions. That's why it's so precious for us to say, God, if I am racist, if I have blind spots in my heart, if my hurt that I felt is blinding me towards loving the people around me, then God, forgive me for that because I want to be in line with you. I want to be in line with you. The disciples actually, um, yeah, so <laughs> this, this whole idea of calling fire from heaven is what they think Jesus wants. And it's that question, do you know what Jesus really wants? Now, there's something that is really good that happens here. The disciples are actually where we can learn from. The disciples weren't all bad. Actually, they did something really good. So they go into Samaria. This village says, we don't want your kind around here. Take the long way. Go to Jerusalem. Now, the disciples at that point could have been like, you know what? I'm calling down fire from heaven. I don't need Jesus' approval. We're just going to call the airstrike. You know, like they could have just done that, but they didn't. They ran back to Jesus. They run back to Jesus. They ask him what he wants, what he, whether they should do it. Then they listen to him, and then he goes, and then they go on. This is the key for how you deal with what's going on in your life, or even how we deal with what's going on in the world, like the stress of the situation, or the pressures that we feel based on uh, political instability, or the hate that we have towards groups of people or certain leaders. First of all, run to Jesus. Just like the disciples, they just ran to Jesus and said, Jesus, let's do this. Let's kill them all. Right? Go to him with however you're feeling. Like They just went out there straight up and just told Jesus. And it was a dumb idea, but they went and told Jesus. The second thing is though Jesus told them off and said, no, that's a dumb idea. We're not doing that. Like That's not how we roll. 
He's, he rebuked them. And the disciples listened. There was no, like, talk back and, like, are you sure? But these are Samaritans, you know, Jesus. They just listened to him, and they're like, oh. And then what happens next? Jesus is like, we'll just go to a different village. There's no drama. There's no, like, oh, let's just go and bother them. Let's just flex a little bit over there. They just run to Jesus. Jesus tells them what he thinks. They listen to Jesus, and then they follow Jesus. They just go to another village. This passage is actually just five verses, like 51 to 56. It's really short. But it shows us that sometimes we can get so worked up over a situation that we lose sight and we get more and more anxious. We get more and more angry. We get more and more frustrated that we forget actually just how great it is that we can just run to Jesus. And so precious, when you listen to him, you start to realize that in his life, he demonstrates what love looks like. Now, I know for a lot of us, we might have, like, bad experiences. We might have been hurt before. We might still be hurting today because of what's happened in society with uh, our culture and other cultures and how we look at things. And because of that, we start treating other people differently and not in a good way, with pride, with arrogance, looking down on them. To be honest... Uh, our church, like we're Chinese now, the next iterations of this, it's not just going to be Chinese. Like, If our love is for people, if our love is for God's name to be shared everywhere, then we're like, okay, God, what opportunities are there going to be for me to invite the people I work with, the people in my schools to come and know Jesus? We're gathered together partially because we're like mostly ethnically Chinese, but really because our God is so wonderful because he loved us, because we don't deserve to go in his family, and yet he lets us be there. And that love that we have means that in our culture, we can still share and love and bless people. And there can be this mixing of different cultures, all for the glory of God, without fear. And that's where we start with actually just this idea of repenting, of just saying sorry to God, just telling him, actually, God, I do hold biases in my heart. And it, maybe it's about race, maybe it's about wealth, maybe it's about status, maybe it's about um, even gender. There could be any number of these things. But we start by saying, God, actually, I'm sorry. If I don't see the world the way that you see it, then change my heart, change my eyesight. God, I want to look to you. I want to be more like you. I don't want to be like a bitter, angry, old, monologuing man, because that's, that's my fear, that that's going to end up with me. So God, let my heart be soft, let it be tender, so that I continue to learn and grow and be a blessing until the very end. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, um, we thank you so much because you are indeed so gracious and so wonderful. Like, we really don't deserve your forgiveness, and yet you welcome us in. Jesus, even as we come and, and worship now, as we think about what you've done, we remember that um, on the cross, you gave your life for us. And the blood that you shed is, is like the same blood that we all bleed. We are all still human. And yet in your divinity, you brought us freedom. So, Jesus, will you wash us clean? We repent now as we come and worship. We turn from our old ways. And we will look to you. May your spirit move as we come and worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's come and worship. Yeah, we're just going to come to a time of worship. But if you want to spend a few moments just... Uh, with you and God, then just feel free to do so and uh, maybe use this time to just ask God uh, to show, um, yeah, the iniquities, the um, imperfections, um, the flaws and the biases in our hearts. Um, and just ask him to reveal that to us and, and for us to just repent to him um, and tell him that we're sorry. And ask him to just really change us from the inside out.
wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me wise We're going to be, uh, even as we continue to worship and probably sing one more song and just reflect, uh, we also want to open up time for if people want to receive prayer or there's something that wants to uh, pray with one of us. Uh, Auntie will be in the back uh, and I'll be in the front and just feel free to come up even as we come and worship this last song. Uh, and we just have a chance to pray for you uh, for whatever's going on in your heart. Um, so uh, let's come in and continue to worship. And if the Spirit leads you, uh, you can find Aunt Sonia in the back or myself in the front to receive prayer. invite you to stand and show you worship.
Lord Jesus, indeed, have your way in us. Let's turn from our old ways, our old way of thinking.